Good morning and uh, welcome to the May 3rd meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Could we please have a roll call? Commissioner Rotkin. Here. Commissioner Chase. Here. Commissioner Bottorf. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Leopold. Here. Commissioner Alternate McMulhern. Here. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commissioner Caput. Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner Bertrand. Here. And Commissioner Lowe. Here. All right, we will start the meeting with oral communications. It's an opportunity to address the commission about items under the purview of the Regional Transportation Commission. You'll have three minutes. Please come forward. Good morning. Good morning, Gail McNulty, county resident, speaking just on my own behalf at this moment. Our county has constraints. We're between the mountains, the bay, the ag land. Our water is limited, and many have a strong desire to help us avoid becoming a bedroom community for Silicon Valley. I've spent the last year, or the past year, connecting the dots and piecing together our transportation puzzle. Through conversations with many people who have been here much longer than me, I'm getting to know our local political history as well. And as someone who's advocating for meaningful and realistic change, I'm disheartened and depressed to feel the reality of our local political machine. A machine steered primarily by those who are not affected by daily gridlock. Leaders who know our constraints and fear that if it becomes easy to live here and commute from elsewhere, we might grow beyond our means. I realize this is a challenge, and I realize there is no easy answer. These same people are unafraid of a train because they know it won't get enough people to and from where they need to go to change our county. And perhaps they know there will never be a train. At the other end of our county, hardworking parents, some of whom work multiple jobs, sit in gridlock daily, paying extra hours of childcare and missing time that could be spent helping their children to do homework so that they could build a different future. I recently learned a new verb. I'm told the verb Santa Cruz means to take an issue and pit liberals against liberals, creating a conversation that is so polarizing that a resolution simply cannot be found, giving political cover to kick the can down the road and do nothing. Please, let's not Santa Cruz our county's transportation future. The Measure D ad campaign promised to get Santa Cruz County moving. We have a moral imperative to calm this conversation, figure out the best way forward, and do the right thing. And we need our leaders to show us the way. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Josh Stevens from Santa Cruz here. I would like to commend you all for some of the improvements I noticed on the public transportation experience. From the banana slug decor on our articulated buses to installing security cams on them as well, and recent announcements of new grants to modernize our bus fleet, step by step. I look forward to seeing more improvements as possible funding sources arise, such as SB1 money. How nice it would be to figure out if it was the bus or I that was late to catch it. ABL implementation is crucial for the riders, not just for the staff of Metro. Turning to RTC matters, I am shocked for a county that has most jurisdictions pay for parking to fund their general fund while Iowa Pacific gets a free pass. <coughs> parking cars on our rail line and not paying the RTC, our c which is not paying our community by proxy a single dime. We need a leader directing our branch line. It is time to move forward with your common carrier agreement. Please don't run on Santa Cruz time. We need our community moving. What's more is that the same tracks on the main line part to traverse Santa Cruz County for about two and a half miles east of the Pajaro River. They also 
get us moving on a national level, and we need to work on connecting to this asset. My other and only car is the Coast Starlight app. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us during oral communication? Seeing none, I'll ask if there's any additions or deletions to the consent or regular agenda. Anybody from that table? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Sorry for the distraction here. Um, yes, we have uh, a replacement page for item 10. Uh, we have handouts uh, for items 22, 23, and 25. Already. Do we have a closed session? And 27, sorry. Hello. We'll get to the closed session later. Um, next, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, I'll see if there's any members of the commission who would like to pull or comment on issues on the consent agenda. Uh, Just make a comment on um, Mr. McPherson. Item number nine, uh, the status report on Measure D revenues. I was just wondering. Um, I think the cities and the county are identifying uh, projects that are going on that this is funded by Measure D or SB one. And I just wanted to make sure that we have a coordinated effort to do that. It's, it's apparent that uh, Senate Bill 1 is going to be challenged in the November election. And I think it's important that we uh, show that projects are being done and partially funded by one of those measures. Um, how are we coordinating that effort or how is it being, is it being coordinated or is it up to e each individual city and county? I didn't get to call them all, so I just wanted to find out. Does anybody have an answer to that? I'm going to ask Rachel to come up to the podium. Uh, this is definitely her um, purview. Good morning, Commissioners. Rachel Marconi of your staff. Um, we have been reaching out to all of the Public Works Departments, who are the lead agencies departments primarily for implementing their Senate Bill 1 projects. I know that each jurisdiction did approve their um, fiscal year 1819 um, Senate Bill one project lists just last month. Um, several agencies are preparing signs to put on their um, construction projects. Um, we did share with them the sign specifications that Caltrans had prepared. Um, we are also working on coordinated um, public outreach media releases. Just last week, City of Santa, or actually on Mon Monday, City of Santa Cruz had released a news release about their Senate Bill 1 projects that are going to construction. I know that Capitola has a couple projects going to construction this month as well. And so we're working with them to encourage them to, um, we, we've been sharing templates of news releases so that they can make sure the public knows ha what projects are being funded by the um, Senate Bill 1 gas tax funds. Um, so that's the primary um, efforts that we've been doing. I do have on my to-do list to, um, actually the City of Santa Cruz staff just volunteered their GIS department to map all of the Senate Bill 1 funded projects that have been approved by the cities and the county. And so we hope to have that um, up very soon. And we really appreciate the City of Santa Cruz for um, stepping up with their GIS staff to provide that. Okay, thank you. So I that's think some of the, some a few of the things. I think mm -hmm. it's important if, if um, I don't know how we can coordinate this effort. Uh, we have to be careful, you know, about the advocacy and all of this informational. But uh, it, uh, between now and uh, November, to say this is how much has been getting done because of and so forth. I think that's going to be important in the next few months. And I, I think it's up to each of us to uh, contact our own cities or, or metro or <coughs> various transportation agencies to compile a list and then maybe coordinate that effort. And maybe this would be getting it to the commission office would be the best way to do that so we could have a good message, I think. Sure, and we, we can definitely, we'll, we'll provide a link to that map of all of the projects locally um, that have been prepared by the cities. Um, Caltrans also has a website, um, it's called rebuildingca.ca.gov, and it also has a list of some of the um, shop projects and other projects in the state that have been um, funded. It also includes the lists of each of the cities and counties, but it doesn't have them all mapped, and so that's why we're doing a local effort also to map all of the projects here. Um, one other thing just to remind folks, our board has taken a position supporting Proposition 69, which is on the June 
ballot, um, and folks I know just got their voter guides. Um, what Prop 69 does, just as a reminder, is it firewalls some of the funds that are dedicated for Senate Bill 1 to make sure that those funds are only spent on transportation projects as intended under um, Senate Bill 1. And so I just wanted to remind everyone that that's coming up well in advance of the November election of just reaffirming that commitment to spend those monies in that way. Right, that's that's good. I think it, this is couldn't can be confusing because one's yes and well, it depends on where you are. But uh, w if uh, you're yes on one, you're probably no on the other. So it, it is important that uh, uh, Proposition 69 assures that transportation funds stay in the budgets uh, state in particular for transportation purposes. Correct. Uh, Rachel, isn't it also true that uh, as part of our Measure D contracts that they have to put some signage up as part of that? Yes, for Measure D, we also do have sign guidelines. Um, depending on the project size and also the location of the project, there's different sign um, sizes. So, you know, sometimes if a bicycle lane project is happening and it's right next to a crosswalk, we don't want too many, you know, four foot by, you know, <laughs> three right. foot signs up because there'd be no space for pedestrians to walk or we'd be blocking roadways. Don't so <laughs> spray it on the, on the path. So we have a I fairly see. accommodating signage um, yeah. program, but yes, local agencies have agreed to provide the, that signage. And just yesterday um, up in Scotts Valley, I noticed that the intersection of Graham Hill and Scotts Valley Drive, which is currently under construction, absolutely is demonstrating that that project is funded by Measure D. So. I could just say I really appreciate uh, we've had a lot of conversations about signage recently at uh, the city of Santa Cruz so appreciate your assistance in our jurisdiction with the signage making sure that we're uh, including Measure D and also not confusing people moving around sure thank you Absolutely. Well, we drifted a little far afield from the item, so I will just. Uh, <laughs> uh, move approval of the, the consent agenda. Second. <laughs> There's a um, motion to approve the consent agenda and a second. Is there anyone from the public who'd like to comment on anything on the consent agenda? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. With that, we move to our regular agenda and. Item 19 is commissioner's reports. Is there any commissioner who wants to report on a transportation related item? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to the director's report. Good morning, Mr. Dondero. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and commissioners. A um, few things to report on this morning. Um, starting with uh, Santa Cruz bike share program, uh, new electric bikes are being installed this week at various locations around the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, the ribbon cutting event will take place on May 22nd and commissioners will be invited to the event with the opportunity to take a short e-bike <coughs> ride. Um, our staff will be sending out you to, uh, more detailed information as soon as we get it. But um, and that's coming up. Uh, and somewhat related, uh, bike to work day is a week from today. That's actually bike to work and school day. Uh, and it runs 6.30 to 9.30 a.m. And there'll be 12 public breakfast sites across the county uh, and 45 part participating school sites. Uh, cyclists will be able to receive a free breakfast, free bike maintenance, raffle prizes, and more. Um, and uh, let's see. Oh, you have to pre-register for the chance to win prizes. So. Um, CalCog uh, <laughs> met on uh, Monday of this week. Uh, I was in Sacramento for that meeting. Uh, much of the agenda uh, is typical this year, uh, this time of year, focused on legislation. Um, Prop 69 was just mentioned um, by Commissioner McPherson. Um, and the good news is that the polling is looking strong for support of that, is one thing we learned. So, but of course, we, we don't want to give up the, uh, you know, keep keep encouraging folks to um, support that. Um, the Air Resources Board is working on setting new guidelines for how transportation agencies will comply with state mandates to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's quite a bit of concern amongst the transportation agencies that too much emphasis is being placed on modeling, um, computer modeling, which um, probably reflects the fact that a modeler sits on the uh, California Air Resources Board uh, board. Um, 
in regards to Senate Bill 1 funding mm -hmm. and the recent round of grants that were awarded, um, CTC Executive Director <coughs> Susan Branson told us that the CTC staff will be meeting in June with project sponsors to discuss what worked and what didn't in the first round of grant selections. Um, we know, of course, there were many, many more projects submitted than were able to be funded, although it was, um, it was a very, um, and it was a very quickly administered uh, funding cycle. Um, we have, uh, in regards to current uh, projects that are being funded locally with Senate Bill uh, 1 money, uh, last month the County of Santa Cruz and the cities of Capitola, Scotts Valley, and Santa Cruz and Watsonville adopted project lists showing projects that will be funded uh, from the FY 1819 uh, SB1 road <laughs> maintenance and rehab account, uh, also known as RMA. That's a new acronym to add to our um, lexicon uh, with those funds. Um, so these funds are providing desperately needed funds to cities and the county to fill potholes, fix storm damage, and repave crumbling roadways. Uh, California Transportation Commission staff is also recommending uh, one million from the competitive SB1 local partnership program uh, for the City of Scotts Valley's Glenwood Active Transportation Project. Uh, project consists of roadway rehab, class two bike lanes on Glenwood Drive, accessibility improvements connecting to a complete, completed safe routes to school project, and construction of five miles of trails in the Glenwood Preserve adjacent to the Glenwood neighborhood. The project is also funded by Scotts Valley uh, share of Measure D formula funds and $310,000 in STBG funds approved by the RTC in December of last year. <laughs> um, California Integrated Travel Conference. Uh, this uh, is an event I attended over the last two days in Davis. Uh, the event was sponsored by the California State Transportation Agency and partners Caltrans and the Capital Corridor Joint Powers Authority. The focus was to have an open discussion of how to facilitate a process for statewide journey planning and payment with an aim to make travel simple, simpler and more cost effective for everybody. Um, and this is particularly on public transportation, obviously. Um, the challenge is to integrate travel across multiple modes throughout the state. Uh, this involves governance, coordinating routes and schedules, creating seamless transfers among and across modes, improving the availability of travel data in open and accessible formats, making trip planning and payment easier for travelers, and, and, and making payment easier for travelers. Um, over the two days, an extensive list of speakers from Europe and the U.S. made presentations and held panel discussions. Perspectives from London, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, and Norway were provided, as well as many from across the U.S. Um, I did it run into our uh, general manager of Metro, uh, Alex Clifford was there, and I think we were both um, soaked in quite a bit of uh, new information. This is a, a pretty um, a very fresh look at transportation statewide uh, by uh, coming from the state level, but uh, obviously wanting to include everybody. Um, and uh, I'll try to put together a more detailed report uh, at a future meeting for you, but uh, it's something that affects us all. And then finally, um, we are, uh, RTC is sponsoring a series of speakers to come and help uh, deepen our understanding of uh, transportation issues and how to do better planning and, and uh, anticipate the needs of the county. Uh, and our first speaker in the series will be here in two weeks. His name is <coughs> Jarrett Walker. Uh, we'll be sending out a um, uh, bio on him uh, for you. But at our TPW meeting on May 17th, he's going to lead an extensive workshop with you all. And uh, the first part of the workshop will be uh, sort of his framework of how he approaches transit planning. Um, he is a transit expert. Uh, he hails from Portland, but he's worked all over the world. Um, and then the second part of the workshop will be how he would apply those principles in Santa Cruz County. So he will take a more uh, local, uh, personalized look at our county. Um, he is, he's well known internationally. He's the author of this book, um, 
human transit. Uh, you can get it through Amazon. Uh, it's not expensive. You um, mean Bookshop Santa Cruz? And Bookshop Santa Cruz, I'm sorry. Um, what was local. I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and um, he's got a very interesting website. Uh, there's some short videos there if you like to sort of t sample what his thinking is. But he's a very creative and very um, uh, articulate presenter. I think you will really enjoy him. So I, I encourage you to come to that meeting. It will be held uh, at the Santa Cruz City C Council Chambers because we expect some public to uh, want to uh, come and enjoy that as well. Um, and then, the, but for those who can't come to a daytime meeting, uh, we'll also have him uh, the night before uh, on the 16th at the Simpkins uh, Swim Center uh, do a, a workshop for the public with pretty, pretty much similar material. And that will start at 6.30 p.m. at the Simpkins uh, Swim Center. So mark that on your calendars. Uh, I think it's something uh, really unique uh, to uh, look forward to. And that concludes my report. I'll be glad to answer questions. Are there questions for our executive director? Uh, Ms. Coffey, go ahead. Has there been any discussion on how much funding we're going to be using from RSB1 to promote the, the report? the 69 ballot measure? I mean, we're going to have to come up with money somewhere in terms of making sure that that's being marketed. And I don't know if it's SB1 funds or where, where are we going to? Well, I, 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 I don't think we can use no. uh, funds to promote a ballot measure. I think that we've taken a position in favor of it. Yeah. And the uh, earlier discussion about making sure people know how SB1 uh, funds are spent is our best right. uh, calling card. And this is what agencies across the state are doing. Yeah, I just want to make sure, because I know that there's a lot of um, self-funded, and I just want to make sure we have enough resources out well, there. Well, there is a campaign organized around Prop 69 that's raising money from the industry, but okay. um, as, as a industry. public agency, we can't really uh, okay. contribute to that. Other questions for our executive director? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to item 21, which is our Caltrans report. Good morning, Ms. Lowe. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. First of all, I'd like to honor uh, highway workers who lost their lives to, um, in the course of doing business. I think I probably mentioned this last time because we were going to be having our uh, annual statewide worker memorial. This morning at the offices in San Luis Obispo, we're holding the District 5 worker memorial. There have been 188 individuals who've lost their lives working on the roadsides. Uh, working for the California Department of Transportation. Eight of those were from our area here in District 5 uh, since the beginning of our organization. We don't want to add to that number, and so we continue to ask folks to please slow for the cone zone and respect highway workers uh, pulled over on the side by moving over and slowing down when you go by. Um, they put their lives um, at risk on a daily basis for our uh, convenience and mobility. Second, I would like to acknowledge uh, some of the new commitments of funding that have been made around the state, uh, one of which is a program referred to as the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program. Uh, these grants are awarded by the California uh, State Transportation Agency. In the District 5 region, we cover five counties, we um, had, are going to be uh, the recipients of uh, significant funding for transit and rail. In the Santa Barbara region, it's $20 million. Uh, in Monterey County, it'll be $10 million. And then Losan, which is the corridor that runs between San Diego uh, with services all the way to San Luis Obispo, is receiving $148 million. Of course, much of that uh, is focused in the urban areas <coughs> to increase uh, the on-time performance. But it is a significant new invest investment in transit and inner city um, passenger rail. Uh, that is in part funded by Senate Bill 1 and the cap and trade program. Uh, in addition, includes um, these are the important programs for climate investments. There are ongoing opportunities for, for new grants, uh, one of which was just announced was uh, the USDOT has announced the new program they refer to as BUILD, B-U-I-L-D. We referred to it previously as TIGER. Uh, these are smaller uh, individual grant awards up to $25 million. They're 
they're focused more on rural areas. Uh, they're, the minimum grant award is five million. The primary criteria are safety, state of good repair, economic competitiveness, environmental protection, and quality of life. Uh, Caltrans may be applying for these. Any applicant is limited to two, excuse me, to a total of three projects. So we're now scanning our list of projects uh, to determine what, uh, which we might um, move forward with. And there may be opportunities for the Regional Transportation Commission as well. Back to uh, funding uh, that, that is being spent, I'd also like to uh, point out that you may see, and I saw on my way here yesterday, is uh, a significant effort across our district to restripe Highway 101 with new, wider striping. Seems like a minor effort. Uh, we're increasing the width of the stripe from four inches to six. And what you'll notice is a significant increase in your visibility, especially at night and under uh, rainy conditions. This um, project in our district will restripe over a thousand mile, a, a thousand lane miles. It's a four point nine million dollar project, and this is funded by SB one. While we're spending money, we're also spending to save money. Uh, this project will actually reduce the annual maintenance uh, requirements and help restore and return a longer life to our um, pavement and our um, infrastructure. Likewise, in terms of saving money, we also invest heavily or invite heavily our volunteers. We have a very effective Adopt a Highway program. April was our Litter Awareness Month. We have an annual Litter Day uh, right around the Earth Day time frame. Last year, around the state, uh, we, we were able to put 3,000 groups um, together with an estimated um, 11,000 volunteers. These folks picked up enough garbage to fill 650 garbage trucks. We're always looking for new adopters. Um, the Adopt a Highway program is estimated to save taxpayers about $17 million a year. Your um, project update report is, is current, and I would like to uh, share one change, and that's to project number 10, the Highway uh, 152 ADA project near Watsonville. We're shifting our um, time frame just slightly. Uh, there were some complications um, in, in getting this together, but we're looking at an 1819 still construction year. Supervisor Caput, I know you've been anxious to see that go to construction this year, 2018. We should have the contract plans ready to list for advertising next month, and uh, the contract would be awarded still late this year, and we'd be going to construction early, late this year, early next year. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your uh, presentation. Are there questions? Uh, Mr. Bertrand. Yeah, I, you know, you mentioned how many people have um, been killed in the course of your work on the highways. That, that's very concerning to me. And I was wondering, with permission of the chair, if you could come back at some point and tell us what Caltrans is actually doing to protect our workers on the road. I don't expect an answer right now. I assume that there's probably rather um, detailed and you know significant effort to make that a successful program. I have a little bit of information to share. Yeah, I mean, why don't you share briefly, and if you want more information, uh, Mr. Yeah. Bertrand, uh, she can uh, provide it to you, but if you want to just share briefly. Yes, thank you. We do a lot of things to protect our highway workers, our most important resource. <laughs> There, um, every year there's new, there are new innovations. We have some equipment where uh, workers are protected within a shield when they're out on the road. We have been constructing roadside pullouts. Uh, we have a new safety vehicle whereby um, maintenance workers are, um, are protected in the vehicle. They can do their work from within the vehicle instead of being out on the road. So we do a lot of things to protect what we call um, worker exposure. And um, we, we also do projects such as what we call gore paving, where we, um, there's areas where the highway workers have to go in and pick up litter or mow weeds, but by paving it, we're able to clean that up and, and uh, reduce their um, incidence of exposure. So there is quite a, quite a long list, um, and we, we're happy to provide more information, but it's high on our radar. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to see more. Okay. Are there uh, any other questions for Ms. Lowe? Supervisor Cap. Uh, 
is uh, how many this year have actually been uh, hit or you know died? I guess this year workers. I'm sorry, I don't I don't have that data with me. We have um, none in District Five. Okay, well then we do have a 9.30 scheduled item. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lowe. Uh, our 9.30 uh, item is a public hearing about the 2018 unmet paratransit and transit needs. Ms. Blakesley, good morning. <coughs> good morning, Commissioners. Grace Blakesley of your staff. The item before you is regarding the unmet tra paratransit and transit needs list. This item is typically um, reviewed by the Commission every year and typically in May. The Transportation Development Act statutes um, require transportation planning agencies that use tra TDA funds for local streets and roads projects to implement a public process, including a public hearing, to identify unmet paratransit and transit needs and determine if unmet transit needs can be reasonably met. Although the RTC does not allocate Transportation Development Act funds to local streets and roads project and therefore is not required to perform this analysis, the RTC endeavors to solicit regular input on unmet paratransit and transit needs uh, to provide a useful tool to assess and prioritize needs in the region. Serving as the Social Service Transportation Advisory Council per TDA statutes, the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee regularly hears and considers unmet needs in Santa Cruz County. Unmet paratransit and transit needs are those needs which are not being met by the current public transportation system, have shown community support, community support and do not duplicate existing services provided publicly or privately. Attached for the Regional Transportation Commission's consideration is the 2018 unmet paratransit and transit needs list with changes since the last year's list 2017 shown in underline and strikeout. The unmet needs are prioritized using a high, medium, and low rankings. The high priority items are those that fill a gap or provide a new service or a regular ongoing service. Medium priority items are those that may supplement an existing service, and low priority items are still an important unmet need identified, but it may have been assigned a low priority because of the general nature and, and the, the need for more specific planning, or that it may not address a basic need such as transportation to medical appointments, shopping, or accesses to other basic services. Within each category, there are three levels indicating to what extent these needs, if addressed, would advance the Regional Transportation Commission goals as defined in the Regional Transportation Plan, including safety, economic vitality, and cost effectiveness. The items on this list input, um, consider input from a variety of sources and is primarily a document worked on by the RTC's Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee, which includes staff from Metro and the Consolidated Transportation Services Agency. Some of the updates to the unmet needs list from last year reflect a greater awareness about the unique needs of people living with cognitive impairments, dementia, or mental health diagnosis. In 2017, Regional Transportation Commission staff worked closely, with the worked closely with the Mental Health Client Action Network to secure Caltrans 5310 funding for two years of operation funds for a van to provide transportation services to their clients. Other updates reflect work done to identify non-traditional means or strategies for addressing some of these ongoing unmet needs and to continue to develop a comprehensive list of needs identified by various stakeholders in Santa Cruz County. This list is not a recommendation for funding today. It does not prioritize projects for funding and it doesn't provide project schedules or detailed budgets or timelines. The list is frequently used to identify projects to consider in the preparation of grants and funding requests. It's noteworthy, I think, that as a result of Measure D funding provided under the category of transit and seniors living with disability, that some historically high priority needs, including same day specialized transportation services and access to paratransit services on the weekends have moved from a high to a medium priority. I think that's something that this commission can be very proud of. Today, uh, staff recommends that the RTC adopt the 2018 unmet paratransit and transit needs list with amendments as appropriate following a public hearing and consider unmet paratransit and transit needs as funding becomes available. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. <coughs> Are there uh, 
questions from commissioners? Um, are there members of the public who would like to testify? Could it be regarding the Caltrans? Well, you, you want to come to the microphone. There wasn't a, a call to invite per the uh, Caltrans report, and I just had one quick comment about that. Er let, let us finish this item. Okay. Um, is there anyone who would like to uh, uh, testify about the unmet paratransit and transit needs? Well, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Oh, no, th there's someone in the back. Please come forward. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I was, uh, it's regarding uh, public transit out from Mesela Beach. Right. And, uh, you know, I frequently would ride the bus from there to get into town, get, you know, back and forth. And recently I'd been cut, and there's no uh, possible way I could get anywhere from La Selva or to La Selva without riding a taxi. And that generally costs over $20 to go a couple miles. And it's really, it's out of my pocket, in other words, to, to get that done. Um, I'm not sure what else I could say about it, but I do ride the bus quite frequently all over the county. Um, um, it, uh, do you mean that your fixed route bus, the uh, actual bus or the paratransit service? No, I ride the actual metro bus. Okay. And that service has been cut? Correct. If I could comment, yeah, the transit district, um, when we made major cuts in our, this is not the ones we just made the last year, but the year before that actually, made a very difficult decision to uh, really, we, we had a policy generally that routes had to be within a quarter mile of one of our existing fixed routes to be able to uh, receive paratransit service to your home or your business. And um, as a result, there were certain, in certain areas, including a part of the Selva Beach, People who had previously, we, we didn't follow our policy. We were running uh, paratransit service well beyond the quarter mile limit. We were forced because of financial reality to make the cut back to that, to the uh, quarter mile limit. And that resulted in some people losing, parat not in large number, but some people losing paratransit service. And this would be an example of that. And his comments are very appropriate to the issue that we're in front of us, which is this is now an unmet need. We used to serve it before. It's certainly a, a reasonable need that's being expressed here, but we just have financial constriction in the transit district, and the cost of providing that service was meaning we'd have to cut some fixed routes that served actually even more disabled folks than, than were being served by paratransit. So very hard decision, but uh, it, it's certainly appropriate to have this on a wish list of things that we would be looking at for grant funding or ways to think about a service that might be restored, particularly with things like Measure D funding. So. It's just, it should be added to the list as uh, he's suggesting. And I don't know if we have to add something specific for that particular uh, place, but we certainly should note, it's already, it's listed here among the things that we have to provide, restoring the service to uh, areas the transit district had to cut. Um, so I don't know that we have to list the, you know, your particular place, but it's helpful to have your testimony that this is a real problem for someone that lives in our county. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Johnson. So, uh, I know from my mom, who's 95, has used paratransit uh, considerably, but she's uh, right in the heart of uh, Watsonville. Um, and the price is very reasonable. Is there a way maybe of uh, bifurcating the, uh, and having different rates for those who are within a quarter mile? And instead of $4 a trip, maybe instead of having to pay 25 or whatever he has to pay, he might have to pay eight or nine and double the price, but it still provide the service. I think the problem is that the federal guidelines limit how much you can charge for paratransit service. And so you're, even though you're, you're talking about paying a, for a premium service in effect, paying something more, but not as much as a taxi ride, we can look into that at the district. I'll suggest that we do that at our transit meeting. But, but I think it's gonna be difficult because you basically you have one fixed price you can charge for your paratransit service. And I don't know that we have the ability to, so um, it's a, good, a great idea, but the federal guidelines may limit our ability to do it. But I, I will make sure the district looks into that question. Are there other, uh, 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 is there other testimony um, today? Please come forward. Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carol Childers, and I run the senior lunch program for Meals on Wheels up in the San Lorenzo Valley. Hi, Bruce. <laughs> and um, we have, I have one lady in particular that uh, she's a, we call her a young senior. She's under 70, but due to vision problems, she takes uh, the bus. Well, for her recently, she had an appointment at Dientes over on Commercial Way. She lives up on Brown Gables, which is just a bit north of downtown Ben Lomond. For her to get to her appointment, she left her house three hours early to make that one appointment. Um, and this means walking along Highway 9, which is dark, to catch that first bus. It means transferring downtown. Um, when the weather's bad, luckily that day it wasn't, um, there's no shelters at the bus routes along Highway 9. So she's out unprotected on a dark highway. I would like, on my wish list, it would be that our folks that are still trying to be as independent as possible, that some of those roadblocks to that independence be removed, or at least lightened. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any uh, more testimony? Please come forward. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Flint. I work with Camp Hill Communities California, which is based up in SoCal. Uh, we uh, support about uh, 20 adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, both living in uh, licensed residential care and also uh, in supported living which are um, people who are able to live in their own home with individualized support, um, which is really the direction the whole service system is moving in and paratransit is an integral part of that. Um, I'm also part of a, a group of, of supported living providers who are in Watsonville, Santa Cruz um, area. And um, I said that I would come and, and one individual asked that I plug for the rail trail um, that this, the idea of corridors for people um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities that would have clear signage, that um, would be more direct, more predictable. These are all crucial factors um, when you're looking at independence and, and thinking about not just getting to point A from point A to point B, but getting there safely and getting there independently. Um, yeah, and, uh, and then specifically regarding paracruise, um, I think over 70% of the individuals we support utilize paracruise about one, you know, at least once a week. And um, I think it's hard to, you know, li hand in hand with, with the actual service, it's important to consider the amount of time it takes um, and, and, you know, any implicit value judgment on people's time who have an intellectual development developmental disability. Um, I don't think anyone in this room would use Uber if they uh, were given a 45 minute appointment window. <laughs> um, and uh, it, there's obviously financial reality, but I think recognizing the uh, any implicit bias and, and values behind why those systems exist is, is certainly an important consideration. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to testify about the unmet paratransit and transit needs? Good morning. Um, so I was reviewing this list and a couple of eye catchers I noticed was line 43, uh, Wi-Fi expansion is granted medium priority, whereas other items such as faster run times on transit routes um, access to transportation services on hol all holidays are also categorized within the medium priority. Same with interregional and cross-county transit services. I'd like to think that those would deserve a little bit of a higher priority versus um, Wi-Fi expansion. Like, that, that would be awesome, don't get me wrong. Like, I love having that on the Highway 17 bus, but I think, um, I'd say it if anything, the Wi-Fi expansion should be considered a low priority task because these other issues, as others have mentioned, as well as the fact that we do have some slow run times on our current system, should take preci er precedence over um, such an item. Um, I would say some of these priorities should be um, vetted a little more thoroughly. 
Um, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Then I will close the public hearing. Um, I think uh, uh, Mr. Rockin had a comment. I was, oh, okay. I was and going towards the motion. Sure I, I was just, um, as president of um, Metro this year and directors Rockin, Leopold Bachdorf, and others uh, being members of that, I can assure you that we will, we're aware of this. Um, we are looking in as we go into this next budget session and getting back to SB1. Um, we are uh, very, very cautious about implementing some new additions to any budget item, uh, not being unknown, it being unknown of what's going to happen to Senate, uh, the Senate Bill 1 vote in November. So um, probably we're going to be in the stat, I, I would imagine pretty much the status quo in our upcoming budget, but because uh, we don't want to add something and then have to cut it three or four months later. So that's kind of where Metro is in this, but uh, your points that were made are well taken, um, and I'll relay those to the staff. And we have some staff, Barrow Emerson here from Metro as well. Mr. Schifrin. Is there an in attempt going to be made to come up with a list of what would be done if the SB1 continues yeah, so I that the public can be aware of while these improvements aren't being done now because of the uncertainty, they're up for consideration, their priorities, and if there's funding available, they will be implemented. Yeah, we can, we can do that with or without SB1. Uh, I think that's a good point that we can make yeah. uh, at the Metro, the transit district. Other comments? I would just say that the testimony is very important, um, and uh, uh, we, uh, members of the Metro, will take uh, the, especially the comments about uh, the paratransit service very seriously, bring that up with our board. Um, who is the one who could who can make a difference in uh, in the change of that service, Mr. Rockin? I'll move that we approve this um, uh, lip per list of unmet paratransit and transit needs. That we do, uh, send uh, information about the testimony we got today to the transit district formally for, to allow us to respond to the concerns raised. I I wasn't sure exactly what it is we could do to fix the problem in. Uh, and uh, Ben Lohman for the example that we were given, which I, is important, but we'll refer all those to the transit district because that would be the agency that's going to have to actually do something about it. The, the reason I'm not going to. Can you wait till there's a second to your motion? I'll, I'll, yeah, second, yeah. I'll, second, I'll that. second that. I'll second the motion with you. Motion by Rockin, seconded by McPherson. That, that, in, that is another way of saying the staff recommendation. To approve the staff recommendation. He, that's exactly. I, I understood that's what he meant. Right. That is what I meant. But I want now, to, now you have a comment. Second. <laughs> the only comment I want to make is that I'm not going to suggest amending the, the, prior, the uh, uh, priority uh, listing as was suggested by a member of the public, only because this is not a list that's going to get funded tomorrow afternoon. And this is a list that people will be looking at what, in terms of what kinds of grants are available and <clears throat> whether they're listed as high or low in this thing. I think they're going to go after every grant they get that actually would apply to any particular need that's, that's unmet here. So I, although. I agree there might be some things moved around. I don't think it's going to be a critical issue to do a, this particular setting. Yeah, and I would also just add that the we do have an elderly and disabled and handicapped committee uh, that uh, meets regularly uh, that does vet this list. Um, and so uh, this is from leaders within that community uh, who are proposing it. So uh, there is a motion on the table uh, in a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you for your work. Yeah, now uh, we'll get that. Cal Before we start the next item, there was a, a, a quick uh, comment about the Caltrans report. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I actually got to go on a little late night drive with one of my friends down Highway 236. and. Um, it is pristine, and I just wanted to give kudos to whoever repaved that road. Um, I wish more of our roads could be like, and freeways could be like that, um, aside from the one lane parts, that is. But um, it's very pristine, and uh, thank you to all the construction workers who made that possible. Thank you. With that positive note, can we adjourn? <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Lowe could adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> But we will continue on with the meeting. Yes, okay. Soldier on <laughs> to item number 23, which is our Highway 17 wildlife crossing. 
Measure D project update and funding agreements. Good morning, Ms. Morconi. Good morning, Commissioners. Rachel Morconi of your staff once again. Um, before you today, we had invited Caltrans, who has been working on a very exciting project that is funded by Measure D, which is the um, Highway 17 Wildlife Crossing um, up near Laurel Road. And we have several Caltrans staffers here today to make a presentation on this. Um, as voters committed Measure D funds for this project, we also, and the Land Trust has committed to do some fundraising to cover some of the construction costs as well. Um, we also need to establish some funding agreements with Caltrans. We do that through a cooperative agreement. And so today, in addition to hearing a presentation update on this project, we are asking for your authorization for our executive director to negotiate those funding agreements with Caltrans and the Land Trust. And um, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions about that, perhaps after um, Caltrans makes its presentation on the great. project. Thank so you. With that, I'll hand it over to Aaron Hinkle, who is the project manager for this project from District 5. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Thank you for having us here this morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm pretty excited about this project. We've been working pretty hard on it. Last night, we did have an open house up um, off of 17 a little bit to inform the public of what we have going on. So today we'd like to kind of give you an update of how we got to where we are and exactly where we are and where we're heading. So with that said, I'd like to bring up um, Nancy Seifel and Morgan Robinson, who are biologists for the project, to kind of start with a power presentation, try to go through it really quick, and then answer some questions and give you more information. Oops. Couple ahead. your time. I'm, I'm Nancy Seifel and this is Morgan Robinson. We kind of team tagged this presentation so I'm going to go first with the introduction. Um, this is the location for the wildlife undercrossing on Highway 17. Here the red dot is and as you all know that's that Laurel curve, that kind of really dangerous curve on the highway. And um, as you can see the road, Highway 17 bisects the Santa Cruz Mountains and uh, Morgan will show a slide that's pretty awesome that shows how it interferes with the connection between the Gabalon Range to the south and the Diablo Range to the east across Highway 101. Highway 1. I'm no, 101. 101. 101. <laughs> it's, it's a huge co wildlife corridor. Um, and this was a project need, and that's Laurel Curve. You can see it from the air there. And the problem there and along the highway in general is we have these huge high traffic volumes, daily high traffic volumes. Um, and for safety reasons, we've had to put in a lot of uh, concrete medium barriers to s I mean, because of the safety issues um, and also concrete guardrails. And along this particular stretch in Santa Cruz County, we don't have any culverts or bridges that animals can go under under across the highway um, that are more than about two to three feet wide. So, you know, they don't get through there too much <laughs> except for maybe possums and raccoons. And that creates a huge barrier. This is a, a photograph of what Laurel Curve looks like underneath the highway. This is the viaduct that's set up on the roadbed. And it, it kind of looks like it might be permeable, but it's really not. It, there's a concrete wall underneath there. So animals are forced I at this location, forced to try and cross the road. And they either get hit because they can't get across the medium barrier, or some of, you know, some of them can jump the medium barrier at times. And this is um, just to show all of our collaborative partners. Um, we know the Land Trust, Caltrans, Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Agency. Um, but we also partnered with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the Land Trust hired Pathways for Wildlife to do all the camera monitoring that Morgan's going to talk about. And um, UC Santa Cruz has a Puma study, and they were kind enough to give us their telemetry data for the cats that they have G GPS collars on. Um, and that really provided us with really solid data to, that points that Laurel Curve is a really good place for a wildlife crossing. Um, this is just a brief summary of the project funding. The Land Trust purchased 463 acres through fee title or conservation easements, and so there's now land protected on both sides of the highway through conservation easements. Um, Caltran received over $3 million from the 2016 SHOP 240 Advanced Mitigation Program to complete the environmental document and the design phase, which is where we are today in the project. 
up. The construction cost is over five million, and then as Rachel mentioned, um, construction is going to come through the tax measure D and additional funds that the land trust will, will get through their donations. Uh, methods for identifying locations to improve connectivity included landscape scale monitoring model modeling that showed where there were important wildlife corridors um, in the mountain Santa Cruz mountains and also to the mountain ranges to the south and the east um, Cal Caltrans and pathways for wildlife collaborated on correlating roadkill data and pathways for wildlife has continued to collect roadkill data at Laurel Curve and also monitor wildlife movements with cameras and then the GPS data from Santa Cruz. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Morgan. She's going to do a few slides and then I'll come back in. Good morning. Nancy always lets me talk about the fun stuff. So I get to talk about the science behind the project. So she mentioned, first off, we used modeling. So modeling maps will show us some important information about these critical linkages on the landscape. And so in this case, this map here was made by South Coast Wildlands in 2013 as part of the Bay Area Critical Linkages pro Project. And so what we see, I have a pointer, but right in the center, the lighter green, is the Santa Cruz Mountains critical linkage. And you can see how it links the darker green areas, these core habitat areas, the Diablo Range and the Gabalon Range. Um, so it's a really nice depiction. And if you look closely, right in the center of that linkage is Highway 17. So 17 bisects this critical linkage. And then on Highway 17 itself, we have some wonderful studies that have been done by our partners at Pathways for Wildlife uh, in conjunction with the Land Trust. They went ahead and looked at animal vehicle collision data for Highway 17. And what they found in Santa Cruz County is that Laurel Curve is an animal vehicle <coughs> collision hotspot where animals are being hit on a consistent basis. And what you see there, it's a little small, but you can see there's different colored dots. And each one of those represents an animal that was hit on the highway. And the different colors represent different species. So you can see a lot of yellow there, that's deer, but we also have uh, some bobcats in orange, and the red stars represent mountain lions that were hit at this location. In addition, our partners went out and put camera arrays uh, along both sides of the highway and the different parcels there that the Land Trust has acquired since conservation work. And so this particular graphic shows on the west side of the highway, um, I gotta get my area straight there. So if you look, there's little green dots in there. Each one of those represents a camera monitoring station. And what we found is wildlife movement. And in this particular case, they uh, tracked mountain lions going east from Southwell Creek towards Highway 17. And this path represents a trek that a single mountain lion took seven different times towards the highway. And unfortunately, the seventh time he got hit on the road. In addition to mountain lion tracking, the camera arrays have found all sorts of other native species using the t area on both sides of the highway, moving back and forth. And so we have lots of examples of coyotes. Top right there's bobcat, a lot of great foxes, um, and then lots of deer. So what we've determined is this area is high value for many native species and that a wildlife crossing this location would serve of quite a number of species, not just larger species like mountain lion and deer. It would help improve connectivity for all of our native species there. In addition, we worked with the UC Santa Cruz group, um, the UC Santa Cruz Puma Project, which has done some great work uh, through the Santa Cruz Mountains with satellite telemetry on mountain lions there. And what Dr. Wilmer's group has found is that they have a number of these crossings at Laurel Curve. And so each one of these lines that you see on the map there represents a different mountain lion crossing the highway. And what Dr. Wilmers has found is that the majority of crossings in Santa Cruz County by mountain lions are at the Laurel Curve area. And so this is my last slide, but it's my favorite because it summarizes all the data together in one place. So what we can see is this, we've got Laurel Curve there in the center. We can see that concentration of roadkill. You can see the UC Santa Cruz telemetry project showing all the places where mountain lions are crossing. Uh, we have our camera arrays that have shown us that we have a lot of different species using this area going back and forth. And then finally, we see the conservation easements for that the Land Trust has acquired on both sides of the highway, which are really important investment in conserving this wildlife corridor for the long term. So what I like about this is that, as a scientist, I like the fact we have a lot of data all in one place, and all our best available science is kind of converging there at Laurel Curve, and the animal behavior is guiding us to where we think would be the ideal spot for a wildlife crossing. And I'm going to turn it back over to Nancy to talk about the crossing itself. Um, th this is um, 
the preliminary design that we developed when we were doing our project initiation document. Um, it, originally, we had two designs. One was a co box culvert under crossing. Um, this design is uh, came out as the actually the cheaper design and the most optimal design for an undercrossing for wildlife. And what it entails is they will do precast, they'll replace the road surface with a precast um, bridge that will provide an undercrossing underneath the highway. Um, it'll be placed on top and then afterwards the soil that's uh, on the highway right now on the roadbed will be dug out afterwards. Um, and it, it makes a really really, really good uh, opportunity for the uh, wildlife to be able to cross under. And this is a great slide our design engineer found online that sort of shows a similar type wildlife crossing and this is how the, the view would be for the wildlife. So you can see it's kind of an open laid back slopes. Um, it's going to be about 16 feet wide um, and 60 feet long and 12 feet high and it'll have a natural bottom. So so from, from the wildlife perspective, it'll just look like natural habitat and a, a good opportunity to cross under the highway. As part of the project, it for all wildlife crossing projects, wildlife fencing projects, you also usually include um, other infrastructure, which are escape ramps and wildlife guards at local roads. So there would be some type of wildlife guard at Laurel Road and the local driveway. Um, this is just an example on the right of the guard from our project on Highway 46 east of Paso Robles. Uh, the jump outs at the top are on our highway north of San Luis, Highway 101. And as you can see, this photo on the left is an escape ramp. That's what the animal sees from the highway side. So for, for some reason, they got trapped on the highway. They could run up that ramp and then jump off as you see that buck jumping off um, the ramp. Um, and that's one of my favorite ones because that sign says Highway 58 interchange <laughs> crossing. So that's right near an interchange in that buck. And we've had other animals, does and fawns, dr jump off too. Um, so I'd like to just finally say thanks to all our partners and a special thanks to the partners, the residents of Santa Cruz County that supported Measure D and all the folks that donated to the Land Trust. Thank you. Thank you. So where we are today is we have the project report almost finished. It's in what we call our electronic review, which means the management of Caltrans and our district are reviewing it for technical issues and everything else. Once that is complete, we will be signing the project report. Um, our, our environmental document is done. We got a categorical exemption, categorical exclusion for the project. So we're hoping by the end of May to actually be out of our project report phase and hopefully be able to start the design phase by July, wh which brings us about two months ahead of when we were supposed to have the project report signed. The current cost estimate is 5.6 million for construction, and the your constituents voted to authorize 5 million. So thank you for you and your constituents because this is in your 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 neighborhood, and so your people are helping to pay for this um, in partnership with the land trust who had agreed to put 3 million up, and then Caltrans has been covering the support costs for the project. And we're looking to have it, hopefully, if we stay on schedule, to have it um, in construction in September of 2021. I'm hoping that we can beat that by a little bit, and it just depends on how long it takes to get through the process of getting the plans built, um, plans done and reviewed and everything. So with that, are there any questions that I could answer for anybody? Thank you for the presentation. I'm sure there will be questions. Uh, Mr. Schifrin. Yes, it seems um, for this size project, a really long time to do the design since the environmental document is done, the project uh, plan is done, and it's a, you know, it just seems like it's not a major road project. Why is it taking th over three years to go from, the, from this point to construction? Design phase is going to take about two years to be done, and then it takes about six months to advertise and award a project. Just, it's just part of the process. Um, the design phase, because it seems real simple, but to, in order to keep traffic open. So as part of this, we've looked at being able to keep four lanes open on the highway and be able to build the bridge in thirds. So they'll barricade off a third of the, the, what is existing now, shift traffic over, drill and place supports, put the new roadbed down on the existing dirt, open that up, move traffic, and do that three times. So to develop the plans to do all this just takes time. The plans aren't developed yet. 
All we had was a preliminary kind of um, almost napkin type sketch, a little bit more than that, but it's, it's not that developed yet. We haven't looked at all the stresses, all the loading, all the soil parameters, everything like that for what the structure really needs. So that comes into the next phase as well as all the traffic handling and things like that. And that's all going to be covered. The cost of that design is going to be covered by Caltrans. The the design phase is covered by Caltrans. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And all it was right. approved by the CTC. Thanks for that explanation. Aaron, would you like to go back to the slide with the um, the layout and the cross section? Because it it might be relevant to point out that right there now we have right. we have a structure there now. It's a viaduct. So we're modifying an existing structure, and it's a little bit of a complicated. It's a little bit hard to see, but that it is a complicated design. The little red square sh kind of shows you where it's going to be. We're actually going to end up removing the existing road section there. So drivers, when they're moved over, they're just being shifted. We're going to try to slow them down the best we can um, for safety reasons. And the, the, the um, contractor then will remove the existing road surface. They will drill, um, cast and drill piles, basically for support for the new structure. They'll put the new structure where what was proposed was precast slabs to be able to make this efficient and quick because they've estimated about 10 months worth of construction time for the bridge. So then they'll put the slabs down, we'll get that tied into the existing road, move traffic onto that one and go to the next third and do the same thing three times across the road section. So when we're said and done, before it's all opened up for animals, We'll still have work underneath, but the driving, the motoring public will be on the new uh, bridge. And after the bridge is all the way open, then we'll excavate all the soil out from underneath the bridge, which is actually supporting the road section right now. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Mr. Bertrand. I just have a couple of curiosity questions, I guess. So I'd like to know how the conservation easement works, um, what effect does that have on the landowners and is that advertised, are there signs? I'm just trying to get an understanding of that. that I have no idea. That would be a question for somebody from the land trust. Uh, the, if, 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 can you be brief? You can come forward. <laughs> <laughs> then my second question, is this a site for opportunistic predation? So as animals use the bridge, go through, uh, is there any cases of that that's been monitored? I know it works, but I'm just wondering if that's also something that actually happens. Hi, uh, Stephen Slade, Executive Director of the Land Trust. Um, conservation easements are permanent restrictions on the title. So if you have an easement that allows me to cross your property, no matter who owns the property, I can cross it. So what we have done on this 400 and some acres is we have put easements that restrict building in areas where the mountain lions would go. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, if you violate the easements, there are fines. There is a particularly colorful story associated with this of someone who bought the property, had a house that was clearly a tear down, was unoccupied. Uh, they decided it was acceptable to dig a hole in the area where the wildlife corridor is and push the house into it. <laughs> That was a violation, and they had to clean it up. Um, we have someone that monitors our properties. Okay, we, we call that the, the house in the hole violation. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nancy will be able to respond to the other issue about the animals. Um, Tony Clevenger, who's one of the experts nationwide and internationally on wildlife connectivity um, issues and does a lot of work up in Banff, Canada with similar structures. Um, has done studies and so has um, his co-worker Marcel Hauser from the Western Transportation Institute and they've done studies that have dispelled the fact that uh, an undercrossing will create a, a trap for animals and predators can prey on them more easily. They found that there's no correlation. Does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Ms. Hoffman, go first. Thank you. Um, when it comes to the <coughs> land trust and the 463 acres, uh, would this be used for any other purpose, uh, such as any trails or anything else in terms of um, pe uh, people being able to use um, this particular um, easement? Um, uh, Stephen Slade again. Uh, no, there's no public access planned on these trails. All the, 
all that land is has private landowners and we just hold the easements okay. so the landowners um, have control mm -hmm. of the rest of the property they just can't bother the wildlife uh, my constituents in the Laurel community were hoping that they could uh, <laughs> they could use this to get across because when they closed the Laurel Curve uh, exit where people could turn left, that was a big impact that Caltrans made to that community. Um, others, uh, Mr. Dondero. Um, yes, I I would just like to acknowledge um, what a great partnership uh, this has been to get this project to this point. Um, the three million that the land trust is putting in towards the, const um, the the building of the project does not include uh, what you spent on actually acquiring the easements. Is that correct, Stephen? Yeah. So, um, and the land trust, when they approached us on first on this project, um, was was already uh, had some of these easements in place, and they were working, I think, on the final piece. So they basically did this. They advanced on this project uh, somewhat at risk. They had no guarantees that Caltrans was going to um, get as excited as they have. Of course, they, we know it's been a great story, s you know, since then. So, um, and then, of course, and that was before, of course, well before Measure D was uh, e even um, um, determined to be on the ballot. So, uh, everything came together in, 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 in really great ways, and um, I think we should all be uh, happy to see what we can do with a relatively small amount of money to <coughs> do something that's going to benefit the community and uh, both the two-legged and the four-legged varieties, uh, you know, for, for many years to come. And I'm, I've worked with Nancy Seipel um, over the years on different projects, and I know that she'll soon be um, retiring. She's going to be beat me to the punch. But I just want to acknowledge the great work that you've done, Nancy. Um, you've, I know you've been a real champion for this. and other wildlife related type projects so uh, thank you uh, mr Schifrin. yes um i think this is a great example of how complicated it can be to do a simple project when <laughs> i remember hearing it early on uh, they just want to do a little wildlife connection <coughs> on highway 17 sounded like what's the big deal you just dig a hole and let the uh, animals go <laughs> through um, and you know the amount of money it's costing the amount of time it's taking the commitment that the land trust has made to this project I think is very uh, commendable the commitment that Caltrans is now making I think they started out somewhat skeptical in Caltrans about whether this was really a worthwhile project to do but it sounds like they've really uh, gotten totally involved in it and I think now with uh, measure D funding uh, and the ability to uh, use it in an effective way, it's going to be possible to do this, uh, to get this project actually cons con uh, constructed in and of benefit to the wildlife of the county. So um, on the basis of that, I'll move the staff recommendation and thank uh, all the cooperating parties to, for the work that they've done. Second. So there's a motion by Schiffer and seconded by Rock, and we do have to take public comment as well. Um, I just wanted to add uh, uh, just a couple of remarks uh, and a, a question. Um, is there other wildlife tunnels in the Caltrans system? Like this? Um, I believe there are some. And I know there's a br big bridge that's proposed down in District 7 across 101. And uh, some of the other districts um, up on Highway 89 by Truckee. They've put in under crossings. It's m much simpler. I mean, it took time, but they were on pr relatively flat ground and two-lane highways, and they've put in multiple crossings for migratory deer herds. They've also done work up on Highway 5 near Shasta, and District 11 down south has d done a project on Highway 76, 76 and put in under crossings, and um, similar features with j escape ramps and um, fencing. Um, so around the state, there have been other projects. Some of them aren't well advertised because they're part of larger projects. This is the first project that would be specifically for mountain lions and undercrossing for mountain lions. Thank you. Um, I also want to uh, uh, add my appreciation to the land trust because in addition to all the work they did in terms of uh, uh, doing the conservation easement uh, and doing a lot of work in Sacramento and other places to get the build the support for it. They also build support in the community by doing regular presentations with uh, Dr. Wilmers 
uh, which were well attended and made people aware of this issue. I know that I attended one uh, several years back that I learned a lot about mountain lions. Uh, it's a, it, was a, it was a fascinating presentation and it helped me better understand the importance of this, uh, um, of, of the importance of this wildlife tunnel. So thank you to all involved. Now I'll see if there's members of the public who would like to uh, make any comments. <coughs> Stephen Slade from the Land Trust. I just want to thank you for your partnership and your work on this. We, we, when saying that we started this, it was kind of a risky thing, is an understatement of all times. And we weren't even smart enough to know how risky it was to <laughs> suggest to Caltrans what they should do on our highways, okay? <laughs> We've learned our lesson. They've been very uh, graceful. And we look forward to getting this project done as quickly as possible. And we have some other projects in common. We'd like to see those done as quickly as possible, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being a great partner. Is there other uh, who would like to address us? Uh, seeing none, uh, uh, there's a motion by Schifrin, seconded by Rockin. All in favor, hey. oh, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, you know, I'm glad Andy Schifrin asked the question about timing, uh, of two and a half, three years of uh, uh, what I consider something of a delay. Does Caltrans ever have a sense of urgency to expedite things? I mean, we're, you know, animals are going to die here while, while we're planning on the back of napkins and <coughs> so forth. So it, it just seems like to take two and a half years to build a relatively small project. This is five million, six million dollars, not five billion dollars. And so I just, it bothers me that um, we're, we're so comfortable with uh, the, the timing here, so. It's, it seems real, relatively easy. Um, so let's take a step back then. What it, we're building through is an existing viaduct, which already has structural components to it with tendons that go down that we have to try to avoid because we're not removing the whole viaduct, we're only going through part of it. So it's gonna take a lot more time to try to figure out exactly where we're gonna place this to miss all these items that are already there for support for the existing viaduct. It's the process it takes to go through the calculations, the design, the creation of plans, specs, and estimates just to get done. It's just, it's what it takes. We're not sitting on it. Um, like I said, at this point, we're already two months ahead of schedule. We've been moving continuously with it. We will move continuously with it in the future. If we can move it forward faster, we will. Um, but I don't want to promise something here that I can't deliver. Um, it, it's just what it takes to get all the studies done for the design and get both the structures design and the roadway design and meet with the biologists, the landscape architects to make sure everything is coordinated as one smooth piece. But can't you do a lot of that concurrently? Can't you, no. you know, one person is meeting over here, another person is meeting over here. Can't you consolidate the timing of the bid process? Uh, it takes, uh, I mean, the a six month, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, uh, a situation where it's uh, by law, you have to, I guess you have to do it. Uh, but at the same time, it just seems like everything moves in a um, pretty slow process. And it's, uh, I think it's a frustration of, of people in general who have, uh, you know, given to Measure D, have expectations of Measure D, and then it's a glacial sort of process that, eh, you know, we'll, we'll take our time. But thank you. It, it, it does appear that way, and there's a lot of legislative issues that we have to follow when we put things to bid, how long we have to advertise them, and things that we have to check then once the project is bid from each of the contractors before awarding it. And it's just, it's a lot of process and paperwork that takes four to six months once we've reached RTL, just to get the contractor on board. And, and a lot of that we don't have any choice on because a lot of it is legislatively st set for what we have to follow for advertising. <coughs> okay, thank you. I'm trying to get to a vote here. Um, <laughs> uh, I see Mr. Rockin's hand is up. Uh, I'll see if he has a, a comment. I do. Um, I'll make it brief. Animals have been killed on this highway since it was built as the first state highway in California in 1911. If this could be fixed in three more years, I think that would be great. <laughs> I'll put it up. Uh, there's, uh, there's been a call for the question. Uh, all, all in favor of, 
of the motion by Schifrin and Rockin, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously, and we extend our great thanks to all the partners on this project. Next, we will move to item 24, which is the Measure D Community Bridges Lift Line Five Year Program. Good morning, Commissioners. Grace Blake, Sleeve, your staff again. Um, before getting started, I wanted to note a correction to the staff recommendation number two on the first page of the staff report. The date of the public hearing to consider public input on the Measure D five year plan under the transit and seniors and people with disabilities category should be June 14th, 2018, not June 7th. The correction reflects the change of the regularly scheduled RTC meeting to June 14th. That meeting will be held in the city of Watsonville. So the item before you discusses the 4% of net measure D revenues allocated to the Consolidated Transportation Services Agency for Santa Cruz County. The agency community bridges lift line, which I believe you're familiar with, serves as the Consolidated Transportation Service Agency in Santa Cruz County. Lift line, the lift line program provides specialized non-emergency health and medical transportation for low income seniors and disabled residents in Santa Cruz County and riders are not charged a fare for their service. This 4% of the measure, measure D revenues allocated to Community Bridges Lift Line is part of the overall 20% of net measure D revenues designated for transit for seniors and people with disabilities category. The other 16% of this category is allocated to the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District. Each agency receiving Measure D revenue is required to annually develop, update, and hold a public hearing to adopt a five-year program of projects, identifying how they will deliver Measure D projects in the upcoming five years. Agency must also submit an annual report describing their actual expenditures and progress towards these goals. The Measure D five-year Funding, excuse me, the Measure D five-year funding projection fiscal year 18 through 23 for direct allocation to community bridges is estimated to be close to $4 million for the five-year period with an average annual distribution of almost 800,000. The draft five-year plan covering the period fiscal year 18, 19 through fiscal year 22, 23 for direct allocation to community bridges is included in your packet as attachment two of this item. <coughs> Similarly to the prior year five year plan, Community Bridges proposes dedicating approximately 50% of this allocation towards service expansion, including funder for funding for new driver positions, funding for a new driver trainer who also serves as a backup driver, funding for outreach, funding for an administrative assistant and dispatcher. Similar to the prior year, these Measure D funds will allow for an extension of service from five days to seven days per week and extend service, expand service hours from 10.30 to 3.30 to 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. The other 50% of Measure D funds allocated to community bridges is planned to be used for capital investments, including the purchase of vehicles and equipment and some funding, <coughs> some funding to go toward the purchase or lease of a new operations facility. Community Bridges is the only agency receiving a direct allocation of Measure D funds that is not a public agency and therefore does not have a public meeting subject um, to a public hearing. Therefore, approval of this five-year plan will be overseen by the Regional Transportation Commission <coughs> excuse me, to meet the requirement for a public hearing. The Regional um, Transportation Commission's Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee reviewed this five-year plan at its April 12, 2018 meeting. And of course, this plan will be updated annually based on project schedules and cost information as well as any other grants that may be received to secure projects. I would like to turn it over to Kirk Ants to discuss um, this five-year plan in more detail and following his presentation, um, consider the staff recommendation that the Regional Transportation Commission provide input on the Measure D five-year program of projects for community bridges and schedule the public hearing for the June 14th, 2018 um, meeting to consider public input on this plan. Thank you. <coughs> Are there questions from commissioners? Seeing none, I'll see if there is any questions from the public. Are there any testimony? Oh, Mr. Schifrin now has. Uh, a I was waiting to see if somebody from the lift line was going to make a uh, was going to say anything because I have some question. I have a question yeah. for lift line. <coughs> I figured they would. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners and staff. My name is Kirk Ants. I'm the program director for Community Bridges Liftline Program. 
We um, act as the Consolidated Transportation Service Agency for Santa Cruz County. And I want to uh, thank Grace for giving such a, a detailed report on our five-year plan and uh, what we have budgeted to do. And you have a question, uh, Andy? I want to start with a question. Yes. Um, from looking over the material, it appears that um, the, the program has lost some outside grants that were fairly significant over that were available last year that are not available now. I don't remember whether they're federal, state, or it seemed to be two that were <coughs> not being funded this year. Is the Measure D money intended to uh, make up for the loss of those grants? I mean, it's the, the staff report and the presentation talked about kind of an increase in service, but is it really going to be an increase of service, or is it really how much is it just maintaining service given that other grant, uh, uh, grant sources were lost? Okay. Um, I'm not actually sure which uh, grants that would be. I don't think we have lost any grants. We did lose a outside contract, which was the Winter Shelter Program, which was a large uh, portion of our um, units of service. They were, uh, that was taken over by the Salvation Army, and um, we, we provided 30,000 rides annually over a period of about five to six months. Uh, there were some TDA funding that went into that, and then the, um, the Salvation Army and the folks that r ran before them, they paid the difference for that transportation, so that wasn't really a loss of grant. Um, starting. March 1st, uh, Community Bridges has received a grant and has implemented it already for additional funding for same day and out of county services, which will provide uh, actually additional transportation. So um, I'm not aware of losing any grants other than the outside contract for the winter shelter program. Well, maybe that, I can't find it right now, but maybe that's what I was thinking about that, that it was <coughs> the, that contract which reduced a particular program um, but didn't affect service elsewhere is what I'm understanding you're saying. I'm, I'm thinking you may be looking at the 5310 program which is a two-year cycle um, I, and, I can't find what and they do uh, <laughs> community bridges has been very successful at obtaining 5310 yeah. program funds for their vehicles but it is a two-year cycle the next funding program will be next year so it may maybe that you're not seeing it listed for this fiscal year. Okay. Well thank you. So I'll just uh, march on, Andy, and if you find that, let me know and we'll jump back into that conversation. Um, I wanted to kind of highlight uh, some of the uh, projects that we've imp implemented and what we've done with major D funds already. Um, we have our new five-year plan on 24-7, uh, but we're currently in our first year. The next five-year plan will take us to our sixth year. So we provided a updated report to uh, which is also in the packet uh, that included the first half of the fiscal year. So Community Bridges was able to <laughs> implement the four positions, the two drivers, and were able to start that service. And for the uh, first half of the fiscal year, we've reached 38% reached, uh, of our goal by providing an additional um, 1,500 rides. So we believe we, by the end of the fiscal year, we'll be able to, to meet that target. Uh, we implemented the driver's trainer, which will uh, help us get drivers and qualified drivers in faster. And that was also a recommendation that was um, through a TDA audit to hire that position. Um, for outreach, uh, we, had f uh, we have funds about 5,800 a year set aside for that. We've um, outreached to about 16 uh, different agencies that uh, work with seniors and people with disabilities and medical facilities and meal sites to spread the word about Measure D and our expanded service from eight to four and with the two additional drivers and the weekend as well. So we'll continue to do that. We also did some advertising in good times and on a Facebook sponsorship as well as KION and KSBW, which we'll continue to um, run um, publicity about major D and ex expanded services. So we're really trying to get the word out about this, uh, um, about major D and the expanded service and build up our client base. Um, so far we have about 700, 
hundred uh, individual clients that we serve, and uh, we certainly want to expand on that. Um, as far as uh, I believe that you brought this up, Bruce, about uh, Measure D signage, uh, we have uh, Community Bridges has um, developed signage for the buses. We had an early version on there before RTC came up with a, a brand for for that. So we have the brand specific sign now that says partially funded by Measure D with the nice logo there that we'll be putting on our buses. We'll have about 19 buses out there. So that's that's good outreach as well. Our buses are kind of, you've seen them, they're like rolling billboards out there, it <laughs> seems like. So we're happy to, to get that done. And uh, we also have funds set aside for the operations facility, which uh, uh, Grace had talked about. And uh, uh, back to the outreach, we're able to leverage some funds through the Santa Cruz Community Foundation uh, for outreach. So they added another 2800 um dollars to the outreach for this fiscal year. So we're um, pleased to be able to use Measure D funds and leverage more funds. And uh, I want to talk about the vehicle and equipment reserve. We uh, have Measure D funds set aside at $30,000 um, a year for equipment. And this mostly is equipment that we can't get off the 5310 fund or vehicles that we cannot get off 5310 funding, which uh, Grace had talked about. And th one of those was a 24 passenger, passenger vehicle, which was all ambulatory, so it doesn't have a, a lift on it. And that's something that 5310 didn't fund, so we um, put that in the Measure D budget, as well as electric vehicle, something else that doesn't come off the 5310 fund. Well, now with the winter shelter program being taken over by the Salvation Army, we don't really have a big need for that 24 passenger bus. So what we've done is we've applied for a CARB grant for two electric vehicles and some charging stations. And we were just awarded that. We went into a fully executed contract on the 30th of last month. And uh, Measure D funds will be used to purchase two electric vehicles in connection with the CARB grant. So we'll um, take $90,000 of the vehicle reserve and leverage 200,000 from CARB to get electric vehicles, which are more expensive, 100% electric. So we'll uh, get the opportunity to uh, start going green in the CTSA, so we're happy about that. There are 16 passengers with, uh, uh, it includes a wheelchair lift and uh, two wheelchair positions on the vehicle. So we're, we're happy, we're just starting just kicking that project off. We will also get two charging stations with that, which will be installed at 240 Ford Street in Watsonville, where our uh, current maintenance facility is. And that will be open to the uh, public during our hours of operation. So we're also happy about being able to use Measure D funds to leverage all this additional, um, um, I call it uh, green energy in the county. So we're excited about that. and. I think um, I'm open for questions, if there's any questions. Uh, uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, uh, congratulations on the, you know addressing the, the, the energy, the, the green facility, mm -hmm. that's, that's terrific. Um, on, on calculating uh, rides, is uh, a ride from a person from their home or their home site to the doctor and back, is that one ride or two ride for the same? Person? So th that is two uh, sir, uh, units of service. Two, okay. Yeah, it's a round trip, so one way equals one uh, unit of service. That's how it's calculated. Mr. Rockin. I just had a brief comment. I wanted to appreciate Community Bridges Lift Line Service. Sure. The transit district doesn't serve uh, with, with the uh, paratransit service everywhere in the county, which you guys do. and. Uh, we have people that w we had this question come up earlier who are disadvantaged because they're not within a quarter mile of a yeah. bus line and they can't either get a fixed route bus or a paratransit service from us. And so the service you provide is absolutely critical to a bunch of people in this county and I want to appreciate that, that that's made available to them for both medical and meal uh, service uh, within the county. I think that's kind of really important. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Ms. Goffman, go ahead. Yes, are you also included on the 211 for people to call for information about um, your resource? Liftline is involved in the 211 okay. program, to, to the best of my knowledge. I'm, I've heard that we were, so. 
Um, also, I just thought of an additional comment for the operations facility. Community Bridges will also uh, try to leverage federal funds, so we hope to get the majority of the funding through uh, federal grants to build that. And Great. Any additional questions? Well, I just want to say I appreciate um, Community Bridges was active and involved in the passage of Measure D yeah, um, and has had those signs on the buses, yeah. uh, 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 on the vans for quite a while. I yeah. see them uh, yeah. regularly, and I really appreciate that, and I appreciate all the effort that the organization made uh, in, help in order to help pass it. And I also really appreciate that it's, it's a very identifiable expansion of service that came from uh, the passage of Me Measure D. Yeah. I'm also glad to hear that those charging stations w will be available to the public because uh, Watsonville needs a few more charging stations. Okay. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it'll, it'll be helpful to have uh, some additional resources for the public. So thank you for your work. Yeah, thank you very much. And I just want to thank the, the commissioners. And I said thanks at the E&D TAC for the R RTC staff, but I really appreciate the work that you do as well. I think you do a tremendous uh, job within our community. So thank you for that. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us about uh, the uh, Community Bridges Lift Line five-year plan? Seeing none, time for a motion. Mr. I'll make Schiffer. a motion. I'll second the motion. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to do, but I was first going to say that my comments didn't come out of my living in an alternate universe. I was remembering the TBA report, and it was in the TBA report that there was a discussion of a couple of revenue sources that weren't going to be there. I think the questions were answered, so um, I just wanted to clarify for the record where I couldn't find it here. It finally, my memory finally came back to me where I had been. Good. We're glad it came I'll, back. Nice yeah. I'll sleep better tonight. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you, I'll still make the motion. <laughs> there was a concern <laughs> on the commission. There was a concern of mine. <laughs> <laughs> there actually was concern. I was looking for it too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there was a motion by McPherson, seconded by Kaufman Gomez. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And I would remind the public that hearing is on June 14th, not the 7th. Yes. Right. Next, we will move on to item 25, which is the Measure D <laughs> five year plan for regional projects. Ms. Morconi. Good morning again. Um, building off of the other items you've heard this morning, it's Measure D theme day. Um, so, as uh, Grace Blakesley mentioned earlier, all recipients of Measure D revenues are required to annually identify how they intend to use Measure D revenues over the next five years through a five-year program of projects. This is in order to provide transparency to our voters on how we're actually planning on using the individual funds from the different um, categories that were funded through Measure D. The Regional Transportation Commission is responsible for um, preparing those five-year plans for the regional category of projects from the highway category, which is 25% of Measure D funds, for the active transportation and trail category, which is 17% of Measure D funds, for the rail corridor category, which is 8% of Measure D funds, for the Highway 9 San Lorenzo Valley category, which is um, $10 million over the 30-year time period of Measure D, and for the Highway 17 Wildlife Crossing, which we discussed earlier. Today, we did not provide for you the new spreadsheet of five-year plans because we are just working on updating those now, and we wanted to give the Commission the opportunity today to identify if there's any specific things you would like us to look at as we're preparing those five-year plans. Attachment 1 provides a summary of some of the initial recommendations that we are um, planning on presenting to you at your next board meeting in June. Um, the Commission will approve the five-year plans following a public hearing at that meeting on um, June 14th. And so today, um, Attachment 1 does, as I mentioned earlier, summarize some of the proposals. Um, overall, and kind of building on what Kirk from Community Bridges was mentioning, we're all working very hard to use our Measure D funds to leverage other grants. And so a lot of our five-year plans include some Measure D funds for a project, but not fully funding that project because we are planning on going after State Senate Bill 1 grants, um, working with the Land Trust to leverage some of their funding on the Highway 17 Wildlife Crossing and the trail projects. Um, so a lot of our five-year plan really is partially using Measure D funds to fund a project so that we can secure those additional funds. 
Um, there are many funding sources through Senate Bill 1, um, through the Congested Corridors Program, the Trade Corridors Program that we plan on pursuing for the highway ca um, category. And so part of the highway category proposal is allowing us to start work earlier on um, environmental review and design work for um, new auxiliary lanes between 41st Avenue and State Park Drive so that we will be more competitive for the next um, Senate Bill 1 grant funding cycles. Um, on the trail side, we are um, continuing carrying over funds from um, that were approved by the commission last year for trail segments that are currently underway and are anticipated to start construction over the next year. That includes trail sections in the city of Santa Cruz, city of Watsonville, as well as um, pre-development stage work for um, segment nine, which goes <coughs> through um, kind of the harbor area. Um, bridging both the county and the city of Santa Cruz. And then new for this year for the trail project, we are recommending that the commission include another $200,000 for segment 10, which goes from J Jade Street Park in Capitola over to 17th Avenue so that we can start some preliminary analysis survey work on, um, and when I say we, I mean the collective we of all our partner agencies, which include the city of Santa, city of Capitola and um, the county of Santa Cruz, to start doing some of the analysis of that trail segment. On the Highway 9 corridor, um, we are just about done with the San Lorenzo Valley corridor plan. Um, we'll be releasing that to the public, hopefully within the next few weeks. Um, through all of the public input that we received last year, we have identified 30 priority projects that cost a lot more than $10 million in San Lorenzo Valley. And that was actually a priority list that was culled out of about 400 suggestions that we received from the community. So there's a lot of work to be done there, but for the five-year plan that you'll be seeing in June, we are only recommending one project for those funds until we finish that planning process. And that, again, is carrying over the project from last year, which is to build a um, bicycle and pedestrian pathway from the San Lorenzo Valley High School entrance um, south towards downtown Felton um, to one of the connecting roadways there, Fall Creek or Clearview um, Place. Um, on the rail project, the commission did review at your April board meeting some changes for the five-year plan there. Um, primarily, it's to reflect current cost estimates for different items and to add funds for um, ongoing expenses in fiscal year 22-23. So with that, today we really are just seeking kind of a brainstorming session. If there's some additional items you would like us to analyze, we're not looking for a vote from our board today, but just to hear from you as either individual commissioners or collectively on things you'd like us to consider as we're trying to balance the funds and how much money is available in each of the next five years. And if there's um, other priorities that you would like to see us try to incorporate into this near-term um, planning effort. So with that, I'll turn it over to the board. Um, and if you don't have any suggestions, <laughs> that is also fine. Um, and <laughs> we will be back in a month for you to see um, some formal proposals. Okay, we'll see if the, if the board has any input. Mr. Schifrin. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to bring forward a, a potential project um, in the, uh, on the north coast of Santa Cruz uh, along Highway 1 in the town of Davenport that Commissioner Coonerty would like the staff to consider adding to the <coughs> list. Um, as commissioners who go up there know, crossing Highway 1 in Davenport is a dangerous <coughs> position. Um, the, there's a flashing light, but it's not enough to really provide safety. Two people have been killed over the last several years, and with the opening of the National Monument, the San Vicente uh, Redwoods to more public access to uh, be con considering the <coughs> extension of the rail trail up to Davenport. The future really is going to be bringing more and more people to that community and they're going to want to look at the ocean and they're going to want to be on both sides of the highway. So what has happened as part of, as commissioners will remember, the federal grant <coughs> for the segment of the, r the construction of a segment of the rail trail from Wilder Ranch to Laguna is now being going through environmental review and there's funding for construction. From uh, Laguna, uh, uh, Laguna Creek up to Davenport, 
there was funds to design uh, the rail trail. There were not construction funds. But as part of that design, the, consul the federal agency has also done design work for what I learned is called a hawk light. I think that's what they call it, which would be a, essentially a pedestrian uh, activated light that could be used to make it safer for pedestrians to cross Highway 1. That's been designed That's part of the environmental review that the federal agency is going through. Uh, it seems to me that this is a project that sort of meets the criteria of one, uh, regional road, uh, public safety concerns, the possibility of leveraging in terms of uh, SB1 money and potentially other kinds of money. So I would request that, and Supervisor Commissioner Coonerty request that the staff look into the feasibility of adding that project to uh, the list of regional pro uh, Measure D projects to be brought back in June. The, so essentially the Hawk mm -hmm. as a standalone project. Yes. Okay, thanks for that clarification. We can hey, look at it uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, um, I'm elated uh, being rep the supervisor representing the 5th District that they, there was that $10 million carve out for Highway 9. And, uh, just for informational purposes, um, uh, we're, there's going to be some preliminary discussions on the draft report starting Monday, this Monday, the 7th, in San Lorenzo Valley Elementary School. Um, then on the 8th, Tuesday night at uh, Highlands Park in Van Loman, and then I, I know there's one on the 9th. I think that's back in Felton again, but the 10th, I, there's one at the Liberty Bank in Boulder Creek. So um, it's, it's really important. Uh, people, uh, it's very much needed. We're not going to have a four-lane highway through Highway 9 in the San Lorenzo Valley. But uh, it, some improvements are direly, uh, in dire need of, um, are, are uh, much needed in uh, San Jose Valley. So I appreciate that. But those are coming on. It's proceeding very well, I think. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, speaking of uh, District 5, uh, I'm fortunate to, to live and represent Scotts Valley. So m the needs of my constituents don't r really are more around Highway 17 than Highway 1. Um, but speaking of Highway 1, uh, I think one of the most ignored constituencies, obviously, are the people who have to drive it every day. And there just seems uh, getting, and I, I don't mean to beat a, a dead horse, but you know, it, it seems like, again, sense of urgency on Highway 1, the commuters that have to travel that each and every day, some 60 or 70,000 people, um, and just looking back from 2016 when Measure D passed, uh, you know, reviewing some of the agendas, you know, we've had, you know, scores of items on our agenda that concern the rail corridor, but very, very, very few that concern Highway 1, auxiliary lanes and so forth. What are the steps that are um, preventing us from making real progress that are prevent us from having to push out uh, the construction of, uh, of uh, auxiliary lanes on Highway 1 that would help with these people who are suffering each and every day. Um, you know, I know that there's, quote, environmental issues, but um, why doesn't staff sometimes bring the whole concept, idea of Highway 1 expansion to this commission? It's, it's, it's like a... Um, never talked about it's going to be it, it, <laughs> it, it, it's going to be and, and um, commissioner we share your frustration with the slowness of the process um, I, I think the, <coughs> the primary reason we haven't been having a lot of discussion about that project is because the environmental documents are now circulating for internal review between Caltrans and Federal Highway Administration um, basically our consultant team is pretty much done with the work is that yeah, we're very close to yeah. um, having a final version um, and what we're working on. So I'll, I'll be making a presentation in two weeks at the TPW meeting about Highway 1 and how we can leverage our local funds to expedite the auxiliary lanes, um, the design phase of the auxiliary lanes between SoCal and 41st Avenue. Um, well, my recommendation would be to move something <laughs> like that from, from a... Uh, T TPW to something that these commuters who are who, who are interested can actually see it on TV because 
when we're holding that meeting, they're driving to work. So you might consider that. Okay. There's a little bit more to it than that, which is why I wanted to have more of a informal discussion about it just to, um, there's, you know, the possibility of having Caltrans be the lead um, in doing the design in-house versus the RTC, and there's benefits and challenges on both sides, and so I wanted to um, present kind of like a, a full picture of what that looks like, and then from there, um, if, the, if the RTC does lead the design phase, um, we can save six to eight months on the schedule. Um, and we can get our project more construction ready sooner and capture some of those um, competitive grant sources that are out there. Um, so I don't think that we'll be done talking about it in two weeks, so we'll probably have a future um, meeting um, at an actual RTC meeting to talk about it as well. So Thank you. Uh, sure. Mr. Johnson, could we get clarity? Do you, uh, in an effort to speed it up, do you want to put it off two weeks or do you want to, or a month really it would be, or do you want to hear it at the TPW meeting? Uh, well, if it's going to be an extended conversation, um, I think your logic probably carries the day in terms of uh, its introduction, information, and um, so I don't have a problem with that. Okay. okay, so we will hear uh, items about, the, more, about yeah. the, the highway auxiliary lanes at our TPW meeting. Don't miss it. Right. <laughs> uh, other uh, question, Ms. Kaufman, go next. Um, yes, I was concurring the same as well because Watsonville did uh, sacrifice quite a bit of the money that comes from D for that. And I know our community is wanting to make sure that we see that in every single meeting, at least something told for progress um, for the one expansion and those efforts. Um, because obviously when it takes you, you know, 45 to an hour to get to the, th you know, 10 miles to get even to Capitola, it's definitely an issue that we want to make sure we see in the media at all times about the progress being made there. And I had one other question, if that's okay. Um, c if somebody can tell me uh, about the progress of the committee that is evaluating uh, the funds, um, the oversight committee, if we can get a little bit of information about where we are with that. Sure, I'm gonna hand that over to one of our yeah. directors to discuss. So we're, we're actually uh, recruiting uh, publicly for people who would like to serve on that committee now. Uh, I think the, the closing date is June 1st. Is that right, Shannon? Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, we are looking for five qualified people that uh, uh, we can bring to you um, to con for your consideration to, um, you know, to select for that committee. So um, I, I think we, will we be bringing that to them in the June meeting, Shannon, do you think, or? Hard to say, we're not sure, okay. But as soon as possible. But remember, the, the task of the committee is to look backward and make sure that we've been spending the money according to how we've committed to the voters. Okay, so that, that's why we haven't got them in place yet. Uh, Ms. Brown. Just a really quick comment and a question. Um, I just wanted to echo um, Mr. Schifrin's comments about the North Coast Highway 1 crossing. I am here as a representative of the city of Santa Cruz, but I worked on the North Coast for um, almost 15 years and was there for um, the, you know, to kind of deal with the um, aftermath of those um, those accidents, and I've seen a lot of potential accidents. So I just wanted to say that I think it's really important. It's a it's a community, the uh, very small population, but um, with the increased traffic that we will see on the North Coast, and we are already seeing, I think it would be great to consider that as a standalone project. And I'm just so I guess I make that comment to ask the question: how, What by what process would we um, pursue that at the commission level? I think there's kind of a, cu a couple of different approaches. When a new project is identified by the community, by the board, um, there's a couple of different processes. One is to start setting aside some funding for the project. Um, because this project is on the state route system, we will also be discussing this with Caltrans and see what kind of funding opportunities there might be there or if there's already plans in the area. Um, you know, one of Caltrans's main missions of the CHOP program is, is to reduce fatalities. And so um, we'll be in discussions <laughs> with Eileen and her staff about that as well. But um, as far as 
programming funds, typically what we would do is we would have a, you know, a call for projects for different <coughs> ideas and then evaluate those individual projects against other projects and, you know, ensure that we're spending our very limited funds on the highest priority projects. Um, that said, if the commission wants to go outside of a normal competitive process to identify this project, that would be to your discretion to do that following a public hearing. And hold on. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, um, add my comments. I'm really glad to see that we're putting money in, in here for the preliminary design work on segment 10 um, uh, of, the, uh, of the trail. I think that uh, we need to keep on moving forward w with the various segments. I know we received grant money for segment 9. Um, and uh, I look forward to, um, to the time where we put in construction dollars so we can build these uh, portions of the segment. I think with, uh, within five years we could uh, make that happen if we keep on uh, focused on what it is we're doing uh, and providing the resources to make it happen. So thank you for that. I, Mr. I forgot to mention about the uh, Davenport project that Commissioner Coonerty's office has been in con uh, contact with Caltrans engineers about that project. There, there seems to be more of an openness to doing it. Certainly having non-Caltrans uh, funds would be helpful. Uh, I also think it might be useful, since some of the commission is new, in response to the concern about why things are so slow uh, on uh, Highway 1 projects, to you know, look back a little bit. Um, under California state law, the Caltrans or the, and or the commission cannot approve a project until the environmental document is done. And the EIR e, e, uh, environmental assessment for the Highway 1 project, the commission and Caltrans, when that started, and I think it's, I'm saying 10 years ago, it's 10 years, $10 million, I don't know, but it was for the uh, high, uh, high occupancy vehicle lane. So it was for the uh, big long segment, it was a big project. The auxiliary lane, and that's being done kind of on a programmatic level, not a specific level. The auxiliary lanes were added as specific levels. So when the, when the, when the environmental documents of, are done, the, the Caltrans and the, commission, and the commission can move forward right away. There will not be the need for another environmental document. But that environmental document has taken forever. And there was a draft EIR that was out. There were lots of comments. And it's been several years now waiting for the final EIR to be done. And Caltrans has to approve it. The commission has to sign off on it. The federal government has to sign off on it. And it just goes into that buzzsaw and goes around and around uh, uh, for years. And you know we've been hearing, or at least I remember hearing, that the final document will be out this spring for the last three or four years. So I can appreciate the frustration, but I don't think there's anything that commission, the commission can do with, about it until Caltrans fi finishes their review, the Federal Department of Transportation fi finish their review, and they decide that the document is accurate or adequate and release it. Then the, that's what it's gonna take to be able to move the auxiliary lane projects forward. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, but I think it puts it into the perspective that this is not the commission delaying things. This is just the process that exists when there's federal money and state money having to go through the environmental review process. Well, and it does sound as though we're going to be getting some information in our next meeting about how what we can do to also speed it up with design work uh, <laughs> before the EIR is done. So I look forward to that conversation. Okay. Um, I think that'll be very helpful and it, it clearly needed. And we'll remind that the you know the second largest uh, amount of money we put in Measure D was for the highway, and uh, and the this commission has been is interested in seeing that happen. And we have to wait for the process to be done. But I look forward to the strategies that we can use to speed it up. Uh, I'm going to open it up to the public to see if they have comments on the regional project five-year plans. There aren't many of us left. Yeah, McNulty, Greenway. Um, first of all, I would like to add my thanks to Commissioner Schifrin and Brown for um, looking out for the North Coast. I'm a North Coast resident, and I cross that street with my children just to go to Whale City Bakery on a regular basis. And 
It is really scary. I actually just this weekend was wondering if we could just paint a crosswalk for now, like just something to give a little more vision. But it is important. Um, I'd also like to thank Commissioners Johnson and Kaufman Gomez for remembering the people that are sitting in grid gridlock. It's, it's really, that as well is really important. Um, and then in talking about the funding for segment 10, um, I'm, I'm curious as to what those design docs would be. We held an event in Capitola last night, so I was looking very carefully at that section. And for instance, from 17th to 47th, we talk about moving the rails to fit the trail in. And then of course we have the trestle issue there, and there are issues with the tree tunnel on the other side. So I'm just curious, if we're going to start the road with design documents, what would those be? Would it be for a painted lane on the side of the street? Because that's the alternative plan for now for that section. I'm just curious what it would be. Um, then in general, um, to help ensure a fair and transparent unified corridor study, Greenway um, and also prudent spending, of course, of our Measure D funds, Greenway recommends the following changes to the Measure D five-year plans for regional projects. In the rail corridor category, all track and railroad infrastructure repair projects should really be put on hold until after the completion of the UCIS. For the active transportation trail program, we have several recommendations. One, no funding should be spent on retaining walls or other infrastructure projects that would be unnecessary if we were to go forward with a non-rail option uh, for the corridor until the best use of the corridor has been determined in that UCIS study. Right-of-way research and surveying for the entire corridor should really be prioritized since this information is an integral part of any use of the corridor. In order to make informed decisions going forward, we need that information. Any other preliminary work, like with segment 10, design work, et cetera, done prior, com prior to the completion of the Unified Corridor Study really must include those non-rail options. To do design work for only the rail with trail plan when we're still studying other options would be a waste of our money. Um, since the corridor is not yet open for legal active transportation, the, 500, the 519,000 some odd dollars currently allocated for annual corridor encroachment and maintenance really should not be included in the active transportation line item. It should be rather taken out of the RTC general fund or if it does need to come from Measure D transportation funds, um, it would be better seen taken out of the rail corridor category. Um, also, just a recommendation, reach out Thank to Cruzio and McNulty. the utilities, because they might be able to help fund the trail with, with respect to the um, conduit installation. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to provide testimony? Uh, seeing none, I'll bring it back to our board. I don't think we're, we don't take any action on this, is that correct? No. Correct. Today, um, we really appreciate everyone's comments and we'll be taking those into consideration as we prepare the documents for the public hearing on June 14th. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move to uh, item. I have a comment. Oh, you do have a comment, Mr. Just, Rockin. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the reason they're almost certainly not going to mm -hmm. move the crosswalk as a quick fix for the problem in Davenport is because traffic engineers and police agencies in general think it's a very bad idea to paint a crosswalk that's not otherwise protected or announced on a highway where people are not paying attention to it. It gives people a false sense of security that they have a right to cross. I mean, they might have a legal right to cross there, but it's also a right to get killed. So it's going to only happen if there's something that's being suggested here, something like a flashing light or something with more, uh, perhaps even a, a stoplight or whatever it's going to be, but something that really lets the traffic know that there's people trying to cross there. Crosswalks are very dangerous when they're not protected in some way. Yeah. You know, on a highway, it's different on a city street. Okay, any other comments? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to our review of items to be discussed in closed session. Is there an announcement? Uh, uh, yes, uh, certainly, Commissioners. Um, on your agenda for closed session, you have two items listed. Uh, however, item 27, the conference for real property neg negotiator will not be uh, necessary uh, for you today. The, uh, the, this commission and the, the ad hoc committee that you uh, selected to work on the negotiations of uh, uh, associated with this have pretty much have gone as far as they can go in terms of the in terms of those negotiations uh, and um, so that uh, uh, what's been negotiated thus far will be before you uh, soon for uh, uh, for consideration 
Uh, so we expect that as we um, uh, are able to then just uh, um, and make sure there aren't any like you know formatting things or uh, things like that that need to be cleaned up in the overall document and that document can be made public uh, for the uh, uh, for the public to interested uh, to make comment to the commission as the commission then considers this uh, at a future meeting. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Schiffer. Yeah, I, I understood that the intention was to release the um, the draft contract at this meeting so that the public would have significant amount of time to review it before the Commission would act on it at its June meeting. Um, I don't understand why that's not happening. No. The, the, the agreement has been negotiated thus far. It's pretty much ready for, for public release. We just want to make sure that we you know, clean up any formatting or anything like that. So, uh, and it, we expect it'll be out next week, early, early next week uh, for release. And that will give the public, you know, plenty of time to review before the Commission's next meeting, which will be on June uh, 14th. So the intention is not to have the Commission as a whole review the, uh, the proposed contract right. before releasing it? Uh, I thought that was the intention. That we, I, I know there's been discussion about the various points of at issue, but um, So the staff is essentially releasing it as a staff recommended document rather than as a document that has been reviewed by the commission. And so when the, you know, with, I know the commissioners have seen it, but they're not being asked, we're not being asked to act on it before it's released to the public. I just wanted to be, make sure that the public had a sufficient amount of time to review it uh, before it's uh, recommended for action by the commission. Mr. Rocky. I raised that issue at our last meeting. I was concerned that, you know, there's a document out there. We haven't necessarily said we like it and think it's fine. I mean, individual people have their views, but they're not as a body. And I was concerned about it. And then people said, no, but in order to get this out as quickly as we can and actually have the public have the maximum amount of time to comment, we're going to forego that. So I decided, okay, I'll let it go. But I, I understand your concern. It's not typical to have an agency release a report that we haven't had a chance to sort of formally act on as a body, even just to say we, this is the draft we're going to circulate, our staff's going to do that. And it was a, a time question of trying to get it out quickly is my understanding, and that's why I gave up on my concern about it a month ago. Uh, Mr. Bertrand. I echo those comments. Okay. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to, ad to address us about items to be discussed in closed session that are still going to be discussed in closed session? We just said they were not going to be discussed. Oh, well, since the public is still here, and since that was agendized as a, an agenda item, may I speak to the item we just discussed? Sure. Okay. Um, how did we get here? We're stuck in a corner, feeling as if there's no other choice to, but to move forward with a contract that is clearly not a good fit for our county. Um, Greenway did a public records request. They've been very slow to come, not in compliance with the Public Records Act. We are getting these emails filtered in slowly. We're going through them as they come in. And I can tell you that they're very troubling thus far. Um, we've learned that there was clearly an unfair advantage in the RFP process. Progressive Rail has been negotiating with our staff since July. Other operators were not given a chance to apply until December. Um, I still commend Commissioner Bertrand, Commissioner Johnson, and um, Commissioner McPherson, who at the January meeting, even without that knowledge, sensed that the thing had moved too quickly and that it was too early to begin negotiating with this company. And they were right. The st staff had been h lobbied hard. I mean, s Progressive Rail, they're good salesmen. They were working with Iowa Pacific. They worked really hard to get in here. They gave their first proposal in October, then were coached by staff how to fix it up and make it more appealing to our community. I mean, this is um, this company, and, and they've been actually very honest with us. What they want to do is come here and do what they do best, industrial development. They hope to succeed where other operators have failed by bringing their Midwest customers to us. The only customer we know of is the propane group, Lansing Trading, that wants to come to Watsonville and construct a facility. To my knowledge, no one has asked who those other customers might be. Um, I, I, it, this seems as though it can play out in two ways. One bad, the other worse. 
I mean, yeah, we just need to fulfill this minimal freight requirement in Watsonville right now, but we really should be thinking carefully about who it is we're moving forward with because we would have to pay to get out of this contract. And this company, um, maybe they're going to come over here. Maybe they've oversold themselves. Maybe they are just another Midwestern fish out of water. We'll spend millions of dollars, the county, fixing those tracks once they get onto the whole 32 miles, which they do want, and then they'll fail and pull out. That would be bad. Much, much worse, actually, for everybody here and for the majority of the public who have no idea that this discussion is even going on, maybe they could succeed. Maybe they really do have customers that want to come here and use those tracks. Maybe they really will manage to turn our whole 32 miles into a thriving corridor of commerce. If that were to happen, it would be the final nail in the coffin of passenger rail or a trail. Everything that this commission is discussing, discussing for that quarter could go down. And freight rail is incredibly possible. Uh, Thank you. Incredibly powerful. Don't underestimate what they can do if they get those tracks. Thank you. Do we really want to get into a debate about this? No. Okay, Mr. Rockin. I want to commend our chair for his excessive concern for public input and uh, letting a person speak at a time that's really not appropriate, in my view. And uh, that's why I'm not going to respond point by point to the, what I believe misinformation that was just presented to us. The appropriate time for that discussion is when we discuss the actual contract. Thank you. Okay. Is there anybody else who'd like to talk about something that's actually on the closed session uh, agenda? Uh, seeing none, we'll re adjourn to closed session. Uh, our next meeting will be, uh, our TPW is May 17th, and it'll be held at the Santa Cruz City Council Chambers. Right. We're meeting in here? Yes. Um.